Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Photo Brigade podcast. I'm Robert Kaplan. I'm, I'm really excited. I've got Neil Leifer sitting beside me in the hot seat. How are you doing, Neil? Doing great. Thank this, you. This is, this is pretty exciting to have you. I, I'm going to give you a, a sort of introduction here, not that people don't actually know already. And what's funny about the introduction is it only covers a very small portion of your illustrious career. But um, the man, the myth, the legend, Neil Leifer's here. Um, he's been a professional photographer for over 50 years, has covered 16 Olympics, four World Cups, 15 Kentucky Derbies, uh, the first 12 Super Bowls, and you've shot an, another one or two since then, right? Yes. Um, just about every major uh, title fight since 1959. Uh, when he left Time Incorporated in 1990, his photographs had appeared in over 200 Sports Illustrated Time and People covers. He's published 16 books, is about to publish another, which is your memoir. Yes. Amazing. Um, and is currently a full-time director, uh, filmmaker, and producer. What a, what a career you've had. Struggling. Struggling, Time. yeah, struggling. Filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've, you've gone into the... So you actually haven't been uh, really doing stills so much in the past, what, 20 years? You've been really doing filmmaking, yeah? Well, you know, I, it, to succeed as a filmmaker, full-time is difficult enough to try to succeed part-time. And I, I really had... I had a pretty good run as a still photographer. I'd say. Quite frankly, now, if I had anticipated autofocus being what it is today, <laughs> Walter Yosho always likes to say that it added 20 years to his career. I might have stuck around, but I oh, think right. I, had my, I had my time, and, uh, and filmmaking is something that I'm passionate about, having a good time doing. But you really need, need to do this full-time, not part-time, if you want to have any success. Right, right. Um, so w there is so much for us to talk about today. Um, and uh, before we get to that, I just want to throw out a couple quick uh, shout-outs and thank yous to uh, Canon Professional Services for helping making, making these podcasts happen. Uh, Tenba Bags and uh, Adorama, of course, which is where we're uh, hosting this podcast. Um, if you want to see more of what we do, it's uh, photobrigade.com slash live to, to to watch these podcasts lives and see old podcasts and events, as well as adorama.nyc to see all of uh, what they do here, because they have they host a lot of really fun events. And in fact, right afterwards, we've got Al Bello, who's in the audience, uh, amazing sports photographer uh, as well. So what a treat today, all these sports legends in the house. Well, I know Al's pictures pretty well. And yeah. That's, that's a smart reason for me to have left. The I was going to say, you know, you've got to compete uh, with guys like this. It's they're insane. really good. And I just, you know, I think I've I pulled out right at the right time. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's half I'm, the battle, right? My, my little autofocus camera now. I, you know, look at that. This is what you're Zeiss using now. Lens. I shot some of the Pacquiao Mayweather fight with this. With Insane. Electric. Can't miss. Can't miss. Autofocus, you know. <laughs> you can have a few drinks before the fight, which is something you couldn't do when I was shooting. <laughs> I couldn't imagine having to do everything so manually back in the day like that. Um, so obviously also, as in the background, you can see you're, you're also very, very well known for your relationship with Muhammad Ali. Uh, you've covered, I think, how many, like 50... 50 different shoots with him? I did 35 of his fights, including all the major ones. You know, we're a year apart in age, and I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to ride his success right really up until now. I photographed him as recently as his 70th birthday, which was three years ago. Uh, you know, I lecture these days as well. I lecture on cruise ships, and I lecture, obviously, on photography, and one of the lectures I do uh, is on Muhammad Ali. I just did it a few weeks ago. I've also lectured at universities. Uh, uh, George Mason in Washington has a very good journalism school. Uh, I have lectured at University of Texas Journalism School. And one of the questions that young journalists, photojournalists, always ask, and of course it's a logical question, is how can I, how can I have a, car a career like the one you had? And, you know, it's, it always puts me on the spot, but I have exactly the right answer. And I tell them, you know, life has no guarantees. But I will guarantee you, I will personally guarantee you a career every bit as good as mine and as much fun. If you can find one thing, find yourself a subject like Muhammad Ali. Yeah. And hang around with him for the next 35 or 40 <laughs> years and you will have a great career. Uh, he was God's gift to photographers. And, yeah, and, and I was lucky enough to be the guy that SI was shooting Sports Illustrated was, was was sent to shoot most of his fights, and I did about thirty thirty five one on one post sessions, studio sessions, right. which were either for cover photographs or whatever. 
here's a here's a fun shot of the two of you uh, goofing around in the studio, and and you know this was this was really more him than me. Yeah. You know, if you would stand to take a picture with him, the first thing he would do is pick your arm up and put it here. You know, <laughs> and he did it all the time. He still does. <laughs> right, right, right. And uh, this was just uh, I did a cover for Sports Illustrated on the we called it the double clutch shuffle. Right. Or Muhammad, he he unveiled how he t- he was on the Johnny Carson the Tonight Show, uh-huh. and I was watching the show. We were trying to figure out what kind of image we could put on the cover to preview the fight against Ernie Terrell, which was a big title fight coming up. Mm-hmm. And I was watching uh, Johnny Carson, and uh, Muhammad played with them. I mean, Carson couldn't have had a better guest there. <laughs> and Ali just said, well, i got a secret weapon for... Uh, for Ernie Terrell and he said I'm going to unveil it it's called a double clutch shuffle uh-huh. well, there was no such thing obviously <laughs> and we invented it in the studio and that's that amazing was the cover. and so these are these are just uh, some fun double exposures you were doing um, this one of the, is a triple a triple or quadruple exposure I yeah. first him him on the right then his feet going back a couple of times then the second image uh, when he moved forward and it made for, it made for a fun cover that's great so um, I'm going to what we're going to do is go through this we've got about uh, 20 photos of you your portfolio we're going to go through and I wanted to kind of talk about those photos before we kind of get into your past and your your career and all that's gone um you know on since then uh so about this photo and about your your photography in general you were really uh, I guess like a pioneer in lighting venues like this I mean because you can see these other photographers they're shooting mostly natural light or on camera flash no 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 that, that's, that would absolutely not be so first off I mean in the, going back to the 40s uh-huh. uh, most of the New York newspapers for example the Madison Square Garden had strobes up oh, okay. the Daily News the New York Daily News had strobes up permanent set of strobes up uh, Charlie Hoff was a great fight photographer for years Sports Illustrated and Life Magazine particularly when you started shooting color. It was really uh, uh, natural light color in a boxing was just just lousy. You yeah. couldn't get good quality. Yeah. And furthermore, the black and white, uh, the, the strobe, uh, the strobes that they used back then, which were had fabulous duration of flash uh, things. Some of them would be a eight, ten thousandth of a second. Oh my gosh! You'd get, you know, that face <laughs> contorted and the, and the spray. You know, fighters would come out between the rounds. They usually wet the fighter down a bit. First punch that lands, all that spray, spray goes yeah. with strobes. Every little one of those is, is frozen and backlit if you right. had a backlight so I mean my predecessors John Zimmerman uh, oh, yeah, Peskin mm-hmm. High Peskin did everything with strobes in the 50s mm-hmm. uh, Joe Lewis if you look at the Joe Lewis pictures or certainly Rocky Marciano Sugar Ray Robinson most of those pictures were strobe lit okay. so strobes went back a long way even yeah. before they were using it for color more for black and white I see so uh, nowadays you know we got we got shooters that are obviously have strobes many people have strobes up there but they're using remotes Back in your day, these are all hardwired right into your camera, yeah? I I always hardwired things because, quite frankly, I never trusted that something wouldn't go wrong. As radio control units came in, it's a whole lot easier to put oh, sure. a remote camera up and, and radio control it. And by the way, today they don't permit strobes, so the photographers oh. aren't using them. But the lighting is so good. And, the, and, right. and of course, you have the advantage then of having camera sequence tech- cameras that are taking 8, 10, 12 frames a second. So uh, I wouldn't use strobes today. Anyway, the quality is so good. I'm yeah, the camera getting... technology has just, you know, especially with digital, you can get the instant yeah. gratification. But to go back to your question about hardwiring, the, uh-huh. the thing was that uh, when I was shooting, for example, the picture you have up now, which is happens to be my favorite uh-huh. picture ever yeah, it's amazing. in my whatever number of years I've been shooting pictures, uh, and I still shoot boxing uh-huh. uh, for fun, yep. or I'm doing a boxing book in uh-huh. the next year or two, so I, I'm just keeping up to date I wanted to have the pictures current if I could but the thing about uh, about hardwiring it when I took this picture for at the Houston Astrodome uh, it would have been much easier believe me not to wire it but the police and the parking and the parking lots outside the stadium, this is the Houston Astrodome, the walkie-talkies would set the camera off. Now, no you had to have the camera off a couple of days. You had the camera up there two days before the fight. There are 12 exposures. This was a Hasselblad <laughs> oh, no. uh, motor-driven camera. 50% of the time, you'd end up looking at your film and it had been exposed two days before the fight. <laughs> oh, no. and hard wiring, it was the way to guarantee oh, that you that's were going to have a loaded camera. Well, this, what's interesting about this, I, I 
read a story um, about how you actually accomplished this shot because it was at the Houston National Dome, which you I saw in your archives you photographed being built, I believe. I, I was assigned by Sports Illustrated to do a piece on Judge Roy Hoffheinz, who was the brain behind the Astrodome, and I did photograph the uh, the building of the dome really from pretty early on. I went down there every three months or so or two months and uh, uh-huh. did some pictures and did the opening games down there but uh, it was such a different arena that I this is the one area where my remote photographers have been putting remotes up also going back into the 40s for right, sure right. certainly Sports Illustrated was doing it in the, in the, in the mid 50s when, when the magazine began before I was shooting but this particular arena allowed you to do you didn't need a fisheye lens to get the whole ring. Normally, the camera would be 20 feet over the ring. Right. And most of the time, you put the camera in the corner oh, okay. so that you might see the face of a fighter looking right. up if he scored a knockdown. Well, the Astrodome, instead of the rig being 20 feet over the ring like it would be at Madison Square Garden or any of the outdoor fights, Yankee Stadium, uh, Chicago uh, Stadium had a big fight. The LA Coliseum had a couple of championship fights. But the ring lights would be 20 feet over the ring. At the Astrodome, the gondola, which holds the lighting rig, is set not just for fights. It is set for a rock concert. It is set right. for a political convention. It's 80 feet wide. Well, they were selling seats upstairs that were $25 a ticket. Mm. And they had 20,000 of them. Yeah. A lot of $25 tickets. That's a lot of money right there. And therefore, in order to not have the view, they had to raise the gondola 80 feet up. And I knew that would give me a chance to get a real ring rather than sort of... I had done this picture at at Ali Liston, too. Uh-huh. And fisheye, and it was a, and it's a beautiful picture. Yeah. I love the fisheye. Lit the whole arena. It's a different but, perspective. But it's a totally. This was the first chance one could ever have had to do that. And of course, it's a picture you could never shoot again, because today the the ring is uh, is like you know like a tattooed. Oh uh, right, covered with logos, logos, Budweiser. You know, oh, yeah. uh, you know uh, the, same the, with baseball. The network that promotes it. The uh, yeah, yeah, and, and the baseball backgrounds. They're simply. Ads, their yeah. ads. They used to be sort of almost, almost fun art. Yeah. <laughs> the old used to be like a nostalgia or something exactly, about it. Exactly. Now it's just no, no. They're just you try to bright keep and obnoxious as possible. Well, you know, I I like to think that uh, a smart photographer pays attention to that because if you weren't looking at the cover of the magazine, they don't want to put a Bud Light ad on the front of the magazine if it happens to be in the background. Now, obviously, if it's in the background of the winning touchdown, you don't have a choice. Uh huh. But uh, it's changed. So um, another question I have about this is, um, were people, were, were you one of the first that was doing these remote cameras, or, or was that already happening as well? No, this had been done really back into the 40s also, but nobody had ever put a camera in the middle of the thing, in the middle of the the lighting rig right. like this, because it would have been, it was pointless. You couldn't get the whole ring, except with the fisheye. Right. My biggest thrill came, this was uh, this was the uh, Cleveland Williams, uh, Cleveland Williams Ali fight in uh-huh. the Houston Astrodome. The next fight, I believe the next fight was, uh, was Ernie Terrell and, and Ali. Mm-hmm. This picture was published in the magazine, and the next fight, there were six photographers trying to get there first so they could get the absolute middle spot with their camera. Did anyone come, come even close that. to what you had? Or they, they, they were just copycats well, at that they never point? Got a, they never got a knockout like that one. So, you know, we, I, I, in fact, I shot, I shot, I put a camera up there for the Ernie Terrell fight too, and some of them are pretty cool pictures that when they touch gloves. Oh, and in those days, yeah. instead of 87 people being in the ring, there was the fighter, the two fighters, the referee, and each manager, and that was it. And I, it, it was pretty cool. But I mean, it's, it's not this. Right. This benefited this would have been a good picture if it was just two fighters just and it's your and your favorite shot yeah it's my favorite shot ever goodness um so so as we're going through you you spent a lot of time with him what what kind of uh were you shooting with like a small camera were you shoot what were you shooting with this was probably an 85 millimeter lens this was just the fifth street gym in florida okay you know his training sessions were uh were open to the press they right uh, and, and Right. Um, Okay, so I want to back up a little bit here now um, because I hear that this particular game was... uh 
your was this your first Sports Illustrated publication? Is that correct? No, I had some <laughs> small pictures, but no, no. But it's nineteen sixty. It was one of my very first pictures. Uh, this particular picture wasn't published. It's Yogi Berra hitting yeah. a home run in oh, the wow, nineteen sixty yeah. World Series, but uh, uh, I had the, the magazine ran one page of color and a page of black and white, and at the time, the uh, the store that had was sort of the the adorama of the early 60s yeah. was was olden camera and i i wanted to get a professional camera motor mm-hmm. drive and a uh, and a nikon f camera which was the uh, the, the camera back then yeah of the day yeah uh well i didn't have 450 dollars mm-hmm. uh, i didn't have four dollars and 50 cents but i mean <laughs> i didn't have 450 dollars it was 300 dollars for the camera and 150 dollars for the motor drive i talked my dad after a lot of just I wouldn't I was just relentless with him and I talked my dad into uh, buying it on time payments today would be credit he had never bought anything on time in his life I mean he's a postal employee uh-huh. made probably a hundred dollars a week at the oh, time man. but I talked him into buying it and it was exactly four hundred and fifty dollars and I went to the World Series and at that series I got a full page, the only full page of color. And the other photographers, by the way, were three of my heroes. Uh-huh. High Peskin, Marvin Newman, and, and John Zimmerman. Uh-huh. But SI agreed to look at my pictures on spec, uh-huh. meaning I wasn't being paid. Right. They didn't use anything. And it turned out they used one page of color, Yogi Berra being picked off second base, and one page of black and white, Mickey Mantle coming in the dugout. It was game one, game two. Yeah. And each one was a full page. Well, the full page rate in 1960 at Sports Illustrated was $300 for a color page nice. and $150 for a black and white page. $450. So on the second day, and the Yogi Berra picture might have been the third or fourth. I don't even think I had put three rolls of film through the camera yet. Yeah. It was I just got the camera. First time I ever used the camera was at game one of the World Series. Uh-huh. So I got a $450 uh, check, shot my father up. <laughs> well, how about was, that? Yeah, he, he kept calling photography a rich man's hobby. Oh, there you go. <laughs> proved, proved him right then, huh? Um, another one of your uh, very, very well-known Well, shots. this was taken, this is when I saw that this was still a hobby. I had really... This is before the last just photo. Just before. Yeah. This was on my 16th birthday, December 28, 1958. I... I really, again, I I just really didn't have any money. I couldn't buy a ticket to an NFL game, let alone the championship game. Now, believe it or not, you actually could go to the box office that day and buy a ticket to the championship game. There were tickets on sale, but probably the cheapest ticket might have been... $20, $25, $20, $25, and I, I had no no right. I, I What little money I had was to buy a couple of rolls of Tri-X film. Uh-huh. Uh, and the camera I had was the Yashica Man. And here we go. Uh, We've got this old, right well, here. Well, yeah, it was an older version of it, but that's the camera, you know. And uh, and it was kind of, you know, a poor man's Rolleiflex. I think the camera was $75 back then. Uh-huh. Uh, but it was a good camera. In fact, uh, there was a period of time, I think, when, when UPI used to be now it's Reuters or whatever, uh, their photographers were using uh, using Yashica mats. So I had the camera. What I wanted, what I dreamed of, was a, a 35 millimeter camera and an icon with a 135 millimeter lens uh-huh. so I could fill the frame with the place. Oh, yeah, that's what I was they thinking. They didn't have that. <laughs> this is a normal lens and it's the last thing I thought you'd want, but it's the only thing I had. And I, I used to wait on uh, right outside the visiting bullpen at Yankee Stadium. Uh, every Sunday, buses would pull up, oh, sometimes two, sometimes three, on some occasions four if the weather was nice, bringing army veterans from, an, yeah. uh, from a hospital in, uh, from vet's hospital in, in, in the Bronx. I believe they were uh, Korean War veterans. But this is 1958. I was 15 years old during the season. This was the final game. This uh-huh. turned out, the, the game was, yeah. turned out to be, the, the they, they called it the greatest game ever played. World uh, champs, and this is Johnny Unitas. This is Johnny Unitas and Alan Amici. No, Johnny Unitas is standing oh, right behind Amici yep. scoring the touchdown. Mm-hmm. Uh, what happened was I would wait for them to pull up. They had... 40 wheelchairs. This is the veterans. The veterans. They would have 40 wheelchairs and they might have 
10 people, maybe eight people to wheel him in. Right. I'd always volunteer. Right. And I had my yeshika mat under my coat. <laughs> As the season went on, and by the way, it started getting cold. I had coffee for the veterans. I would bring, they had rent to cops on both sidelines. Right. Days, and I would bring a cup of coffee to the security guy on the giant bench or the, whoever the visiting team was. And they'd look the other way for a few minutes uh, when I would take my yeshika mat out and shoot some close-ups. So, so how old were you but with this? This, this, this was on my 16th, 16th birthday. 16th birthday. <laughs> the game went sudden death. It was getting to be dusk, the ambiance, the mood of the whole place, right. a little, little, little hazy, the lights just beginning to take effect. And again, had I had a good lens, like all the pros did, I would have filled the frame with Alan Amici, who's scoring the touchdown, and maybe Unitas looking over his shoulder. Maybe I would have been as wide as number 77. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have a lens. So I had this, and I ended up with this picture, which I quite honestly never appreciated as being as good until years later. Yeah. But it's today, it's one of my Well, it really gives pictures. you a beautiful sense of place. And I mean, in Yankee Stadium. Too. I just wasn't smart enough to think that way. I thought more. Well, typical of the pictures I saw in the newspaper. Well, you didn't know back then how nostalgic it would be. You know? I didn't, and you know, and more important, I well, you know, there are pictures of Amici scoring that touchdown, but there's nothing like this one. Right. And this is certainly not what I would have done if I had my choice of cameras and lenses. And so I know this is a separate game, but our next photo here is a, a contact sheet. Some of these are the same game. Amici being carried. Oh, this is the, the same this game. Is, it's right there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. This is a contact sheet, but it isn't exactly a contact sheet because so you can see the sun on the field is earlier and the earlier in the game. It is. It is from that game, and I, I never had contact sheets in those days. So what I did was put twelve of the images together. Right. It's, it's pretty much the. 12 of that roll of film. It I, might be one or two from a second roll of film I shot. I just couldn't imagine shooting such an important game with, with you know, a Yashica, you know, looking down into a camera. No, you didn't look down. There's a sports finder in it. Oh. If you, you give me the camera, I'll show you. You didn't, you didn't look down. That was one thing you certainly didn't. Uh, the camera had, whoops, has this. Oops. Oh, okay. And you look through it. You, you look you look through it this way. Oh, I didn't even know it, that. Look at and that. And the focus. And once you had it focused on, this was, by the way, the play was, they were on the one-yard <laughs> line. The play was, I was exactly 10 yards away. What happened is the game ended right in the, it had it ended at the other end of the field, I would never have got this right. picture. But the Colts ended up going towards well, what is center field at Yankee Stadium where the monuments used to be, the three monuments, and that's where the wheelchairs were. By that point, by the way, there were so many drunken cult fans on the on the field, the security wasn't worried about me. They had already <laughs> seen me, and, and I, I was exactly 10 yards, exactly 10 yards in front of Amici when he scored the touchdown. That's That shows one of your you know traits of, of really working your, your connections, being a people person, and, and really thinking ahead of what you want to do and how you're going to achieve those things, you know, bribing the bribing these guys with the coffee at the age of 16, you know, making making sure you never know who's going to be the person who's going to let you and, in. And don't underestimate, you know, and every sports photographer that uses the word I'm about to use sounds like they're in their modest mode. Uh -huh. I have never met a good photographer that's modest. If you meet a modest photographer, he's not really that good. Most <laughs> photographers have healthy egos. But the word luck in sports photography is so important. I mean, you can't underestimate it. You have to be in the right seat. You have to be on the right side of the field. Uh, the picture editor assigns one photographer to the home team side sideline, the other photographer to the visiting sideline. If the play that wins the Super Bowl happens in front of you, the guy on the other sideline hasn't done anything wrong. He just hasn't got the best picture. Uh, the greatest example of it by far is my Ali Liston picture, because right between Ali's legs is Herb Sharfman, uh, who was the other, right, the bald photographer right between Ali's legs was the other ringside Sports Illustrated photographer. <laughs> He's also shooting with strobe lights. He's also, but now I graduated to a Rolleflex. Uh -huh. I was no longer using a poor man's Rolleflex. I now had a rich Oh, you had a real Rolleflex for this. <laughs> I got it. But yeah. I mean, the point was that, uh, you know, I didn't, pick the seat. It wasn't that uh, that I knew Ali was going to fall. Uh, well, I, Herbie Sharfman was a very good fight photographer. He had taken probably the most famous Rocky Marciano picture. He used to call it the rubber face picture, uh -huh. Marciano Walcott fight. And uh, I don't care how good he is here. Uh, 
he's getting a, a shot of Ali's rear end. And he knows and it. So luck is the fact that what separates the really good sports photographer from the ordinary sports photographer is when you get lucky, the good one doesn't miss. That's important. That's what separates. But yep. luck is a huge factor in sports photography, probably more so than any other kind of photography. Right. And, 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 you know, preparation, you know, thinking, thinking forward, but, but you're right, you know, you have to, you know, anything could happen in front of you. And, and if you're not ready with the camera, with the rolls of film, you know, you know, thinking about, okay, I'm, you, back then, you know, nowadays we have unlimited film. We don't even have to worry about right, film, right. you know, and you had to worry about being on frame 12 when, yeah. you know, with it. well, the picture you have up now has a great story that illustrates this maybe better than any I can think of. Okay. And, and the learning experience and, and the combination of luck and, uh, and understanding the job. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was taken at Super Bowl three, And our managing, the managing editor of Sports Illustrated had made his mind up already that if, he, they were tipped off, to, our writer was tipped off that this would be Lombardi's, Vince Lombardi, the great Green Bay coach. This would be his last game as Green Bay coach mm-hmm. if they won the Super Bowl. They had won Super Bowl one, and now this was Super Bowl two. I'm sorry, I think I said three, Super mm-hmm. Bowl two. So I think there were six of us shooting the game for Sports Illustrated. Obviously, everyone wanted to get Lombardi. Mm-hmm. Two weeks before this game was played was the championship game. Mm-hmm. And about a week before that, I had been to Lombardi's home in Green Bay, and I photographed him. A week, our writer did a piece of him at home with his wife and had dinner at his house. So I knew Vince Lombardi now. He didn't see me all bundled up like you would in a cold game in Green Bay. Right. So I mean, I think I wore a sport jacket to dinner. I might have wore a tie that night. I don't remember. <laughs> Fancy. But I was at his house when I called him. You know, Mr. Lombardi, he corrected me and said, it's Vince. Uh-huh. So, you can't miss. It's pretty hard to miss me. Uh, I thought he was, you know, I thought he was, he and I had hit it off pretty well. It is now one week later, and I'm in Baltimore for the championship game, the game that would bring the Colts to the Super Bowl. And at the end of the game, every photographer wants to get the, uh, they didn't do things like they do today. No silly, I, I've never understood throwing dirty Gatorade on a coach. Yeah. That's baffled me. But I mean, in those days, they picked the coach up. It was tradition. Yeah. Whether it was college football or pro football, you picked the winning coach up and carried him off the field. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you want to be right in front because mm-hmm. uh, as NFL films, handheld television cameras weren't quite what they are today. Mm-hmm. So basically, it was a still photographer trying to get position right in front when they picked the coach up. Well, the Colts got beaten real badly. I mean, the Packers, by the time there was a minute to go in the game, you and I could have won the Super Bowl. Nobody were with, <laughs> were with eight of our friends or nine of our friends. Uh, there was no way the Colts, uh, the Colts were going to win. The Packers had the game. So three or four of us, uh, I don't know, maybe one of the wire photographers, maybe one of the SI photographers, we all started creeping out. Photographers are not allowed between the 35-yard lines. Oh, okay. That's yep. the, that's the bench, and that's the right. coach's area. But with 30 seconds or 40 seconds to go in the game, and the game they're ahead by 21 points or something, let's say they couldn't lose. Mm-hmm. We started creeping out, and I ended up right in front of Coach Lombardi, my friend from dinner right, a right, week sure. before. And he looked at me, I'll never forget this, and he just said, I won't use his language, but get the out of here. We've got a football game to play. Oh, man. I was laughing at him. I thought he's got to be kidding. Uh Well, before I knew it, not only me, but two or three other photographers were taken by the arm, by Uh whatever security was there, and I missed the picture. Oh. (laughs) Turned out it wasn't a great picture anyway, as luck would have it. But now comes the Super Bowl. And our managing editor specifically wants Lombardi. Uh, Remembering what I'd learned two weeks before, 30 seconds to go again, there was no way the Packers could lose the game. But I waited until this time. There were like 10 seconds, maybe 12. And when I got out there, I was literally as close as I am to you in front. I think this was a 24 millimeter lens, (laughs) you know, because there's a whole group of photographers trying to get the same spot and in addition the to scrum, in addition right? to yeah. yeah well elbows are very important in sports photography right. I mean if you were awarding photographer of the century in terms of elbows Barton Silverman uh-huh. for 
anybody that knows Bart. You know, yeah, he was on the podcast. Elbows a bit ago, yeah. and knees. And, you know, <laughs> great photographer, but I've never seen elbows like this. Well, I had fairly good elbows. <laughs> and I mean, I was right in front of Lombardi. So it was a combination of luck. Of It, it happened right. Yeah. Uh, the lighting was, again, spectacular. Remember, they used to play day games in those days. And then the games would end sort of right at magic hour. Mm-hmm. Thus, when you still had a combination of tungsten light and oh, daylight. Yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, it made for a beautiful picture. But had I not gotten thrown off the field, throw it off the, in front of the bench right. two weeks before there's no question I wouldn't have got this picture because they were removing people it was the same thing as two weeks before except by the time I got there even Lombardi couldn't have gotten me you, you turned a negative into a positive I now mean. Jerry Kramer loves the picture I I spent a little bit of time with Lombardi over the years uh, after the shot never said a word about it oh yeah <laughs> well he had some so the, uh, okay so we were talking about stadium lighting and everything too this is you know another one of your classic shots um, well strobe this well, strobe is right this strobe is. lighting um so these lighting the lighting that you had up in these stadiums at the, at the time were they permanently up there or did you have to set them up each time well sports illustrated has set them up today most Certainly, every NBA team has a has a staff photographer that uh, that has a permanent. <coughs> sorry, has a permanent lighting setup. Uh, we set them up all the time, and I mean, what it enabled you to do, you've got to remember to shoot natural light, and it wasn't that good. The natural light, you were shooting 400 ASA, uh, which you're shooting 160 ASA was tungsten film. You pushed it a stop and a half. Sometimes you try to push it two stops. It really looked lousy, mm-hmm. and particularly when you were shooting black athletes with a black background, right. which is so much of boxing. Sure. And so what the strobe lights enabled you to do is you were shooting 64 ASA film. In, in a, it, it was exactly the same as a fashion shoot in a studio. I mean, these pictures are tack shop. They are 64 ASA film. You could blow them up 20 feet square or you could put them on the side of a building if you chose to Yeah, because it was, exa- it was the best possible quality it's exactly the same as a fashion shoot sure you know for Vogue or Harper's Bazaar sure sure uh, moving on uh, into some of your portraiture that you've done in your day um, you, you had I Going again, going through your archives, it's so difficult to narrow down, <laughs> you know, the selection that, that we that we got here. But uh, you were with uh, Joe, you photographed Joe Namath since his early days in college. Well, this was this was again to try to do a different picture of Joe right. Namath. It was a Sports Illustrated cover uh, uh, done in in a studio, and it's a multiple exposure. The first exposure that the yellow you uh. see is the tungsten of him dropping back. Mm-hmm. And then I froze him with straw, or almost froze him. You could see a little mm-hmm. tail going through it in the studio. The funny thing about this is that uh, Joe Namath, as any football fan would remember, I think, Joe Namath had terrible knee, knee problems. It had surgery, and he wore a very restrictive knee brace mm. when he played. Well, he's coming to the Life magazine studio. I shot this. It was called a Life studio. It was shot for Sports Illustrated. We shared the studio with Life. He's coming to the studio to pose for a Sports Illustrated cover. There are no linemen going to hit him. Uh, Mm -hmm. He doesn't need a knee brace. So he shows up, and I show him how to do what I wanted him to do. And you have to keep everything black to shoot. Mm -hmm. So we had... The black background was rolled out on the floor, and it was paper, paper background, taped down. Joe did his steps a couple of times and he came with one person uh, Frank Ramos I think was the guy was the Jets PR man and Ramos was there obviously to make sure he delivered the star quarterback back to the Jets in one piece (laughs) well I got the lights out in the studio we're ready to shoot I turn the lights out I think we shot one or two sheets this was shot on a 4x5 Mm -hmm. camera I shoot one or two sheets of film and uh, all of a sudden Joe goes back and the paper rips Oh. Now, the floor is concrete. Mm-hmm. He hit the floor. It's hard. I mean, it was a thud. I, didn't, I couldn't see what he hit with, but I mean, I assumed it had to be his knees. Yo, no. <laughs> he hit the floor, and I thought I'd killed him. And he was laying there for a couple of seconds, what seemed like right. for eternity. And I thought, oh, my God, I have just <laughs> destroyed the Jets quarterback. Oh, my God. And, uh, the, and Frank Ramos was white. I mean, I looked over at him, and I thought, this poor guy is going to have to go back and explain to the Jets oh my gosh. that the quarterback is, is, is in surgery tonight. <laughs> uh, well. Well, as it turned out, he got up and dusted himself off. Thought the whole thing was very funny, and he was a little more careful when we put out a new piece of paper. Yep, awesome. And um, moving on, uh, we have. So you were, 
You were the set photographer for the Rocky films? No, the set photographer is called a unit photographer. Okay. Shoots as a union job. Okay. Big films. And this, by the after Rocky one, Sly couldn't afford a photographer. His wife shot the stills on Rocky one. Really? But, oh yeah. But on Rocky two and all the others since, uh, obviously money was not an issue. And the studios would always have what they call a special photographer. Uh-huh. And that special comes in for a few of the big scenes, mainly to do the poster that will oh, appear right. in mm-hmm. theaters. They call them one sheets. Annie Leibovitz does this sort of stuff on big Hollywood shoots. Uh, a lot of photographers. It's a very one. It's a very lucrative thing. I like to tell people, and I, I always sounds like I'm joking, but I'm not. Both my kids got put through college by Sylvester Stallone. Oh my goodness! Because I used great. to do all the stills on his movies. What Sly wanted was Sly wanted the fights in Rocky, the stills, yeah. to look just the way they would look if it was a Sports Illustrated shoot. Right. And uh, obviously, you know, uh, who better to hire than someone who actually was shooting exactly. the Sports Illustrated exactly. fights. Exactly. And we talked about it, and I did I did all the fights, all the fight sequences for him. So here's a question, and, and we'll get more into business as we get through the slideshow, but, you know, you mentioned doing this as a separate sort of gig. Were you freelancing at this point, or was it just something you did separately? Because you were, were you, you were a staffer. Right? I was... Well, over the period of time that I did some of this, I was I was contract for a while, I was staff for a while, and I freelanced. But uh, this kind of work, if you did it on your vacation time, was perfectly. Uh, you know, you know, I used to call it a subtle fix years ago. Uh, all the big Hollywood studios would hire the Life magazine photographers. Uh, Mark Kaufman did Lawrence of Arabia. In fact, uh-huh. he spent I think six months on Lawrence of Arabia. He took a leave of absence. Why is the company, why would the magazine be so happy to let him go? Because they're going to get first look at the pictures. They wanted Lawrence of Arabia. Well, my doing this, clearly Sports Illustrated had one proviso. We look first. Right. Uh, I put Sly on the, on the cover of uh, Time magazine uh, <laughs> later on before Rocky, uh, actually before this one, before Rocky Three, we put him on the cover of Time magazine. I photographed him with Jerry Cooney, who was fighting for the real title. It was Life Imitating Art. Uh-huh. And I brought the two of them together. So it's, it's advantageous to the studio, to the company making the film. It was advantageous to the magazine because Newsweek wasn't going to get Sly and Cooney if they wanted them. We got them. Right. That's awesome. Did you enjoy uh, more shooting as a staffer or as a contract photographer? Did you like the freedom you had more when you were a, a, a contract photographer? Did you have more freedom then? No, I was going to say it made no difference at all. I mean, I, I think one of the fun things about our job is that you don't have a boss looking over your shoulder. Basically, you're as good as what you come back with. 90% of the time, 95% of the time, there was nobody, I mean, uh, rare occasions, and mainly because they really wanted to be there, an art, the art director would show up. Uh, you never have the editor of the piece looking over your shoulder saying, why aren't you shooting a little tighter, a little, you know, as I said, if the art director wanted to come, nobody could say he couldn't or right. she couldn't. But it would only be really because they were just curious to, to see the shoot, wanted to meet the subject or whatever. Right. Right. Um, so moving forward, um, this is actually much more recent than, than the previous photos um, of Mike Tyson. Um, obviously, you've had this relationship with box- boxers, the boxing world. Um, how was your relationship with, with Tyson, and how did you get in to get this beautiful shot? Well, it was, and it still is, uh, very good with the boxing people. I mean, I grew up with most of these people. They were young executives of the today boxing is run by by the network certainly by hbo and showtime and, right and the people that are running this running it now were were very young executives uh when i was shooting and so i've uh-huh. gotten to know them over the years and and usually it, you, you you make somebody an offer that is advantageous for them as well as you uh-huh. it's not the godfather situation where right, right, right. Make yeah. you a proposition <laughs> you can't say no to it's more uh this was i went to uh I went to HBO and I said, uh, I'd like to, actually I don't remember whether it was HBO or Showtime who had, one of the fighters was HBO, uh, Lennox, this was Lennox Lewis and, uh, and Mike Tyson. Mm-hmm. And one of the fighters was an HBO fighter, the other was a Showtime fighter, just like Pacquiao uh-huh. uh, Mayweather just was. And whichever network had Tyson, I, I approached them about the idea of shooting in the dressing room from the time Mike arrived dressed Mm-hmm. whatever he chose to wear to the arena. And I would be in there before the fight and after the fight. Well, 
Tyson got the daylights beaten out of him. In fact, I photographed his eye being stitched up. And I will never forget this. There was no one in the dressing room except his immediate people for 20 minutes or maybe half an hour. He then did an interview with ESPN. He did one, I think, with Jim Lampley afterwards. But when I took this picture, no one was in the dressing room except his entourage, the corner people that worked with him. And what happened was they had just stitched his eye up. And while they were stitching his eye, he said to someone, bring me, bring me my son. Oh. I don't know. It was the strangest thing. And they brought in this... this infant really huh. and he sat there in the corner and everyone was sort of afraid to him he was I was in front of him this is a I'm guessing a 24 millimeter lens as well yeah, was, right there was no it. room behind me and I was just about as close as I am to you and you know it was one of those pictures I knew the minute I shot it I had something special now you have some background with Mike Tyson I, I you've you've gone out with him have you not I've been out with him a couple of times yeah you know not uh, everyone just goes drinking with Mike Tyson well, especially when you're the only white man for 30 miles <laughs> in a pretty tough place. Mike was a pretty out there character. And he was, uh, and he liked the ladies. And he took me to a bar somewhere in the wilds outside of Cleveland mm -hmm. where he was staying. He was training with Don King's place in Cleveland. We went there, and, and this was a very tough place. And you have to assume, as you looked at the crowd, it was about 3 in the morning, or 2.30, 3 in the morning. Mike, uh, Mike may have been tough, but let me tell you, if you assume that half the crowd are packing <laughs> weapons, yeah. serious weapons, Mike is out there, and he's pinching butts oh God. on the dance floor. And I am saying to myself, Jesus... <laughs> Someone's going to shoot him, and, and they're going to miss him and get me. Right. <laughs> and I won't even make the newspaper. <laughs> right. It'll be Mike Tyson shot or whatever. Oh, man. Uh, so we had, we had a couple of good times. He was, he was quite a character. Crazy. I love how you have all these stories. Okay, so we got Bear, Coach Bear. Um, I, I was, uh, this is another one of your, your beautiful portraits. Um, and also I want to talk about your technique, because I was, just had lunch with a mutual friend, P.F. Bentley, who I guess assisted you on this particular yes, shoot. Yes. And he was explaining it to me and, and you know, all the gear that you had out there and, and the, sort of your relationship with, with the coach. Well, it's a good thing. That, uh, you know, the relationship with the coach was really just approaching him. Uh, I came down, went down with, and, and Sports Illustrated, I'm sorry, Time Magazine, uh -huh. gave, they were willing to spend the money to let a photographer do this kind of thing. I flew down there with a jacket and tie and no camera. I didn't bring a camera or anything. I had no intention of shooting a picture to meet with him. Uh, I'll still remember sitting in Coach Bryant's office, and he kept looking around, you know, oh, where's, where's the camera? When are you going to shoot? Uh -huh. And I said to him, all I really want to do is talk to you and tell you what we'd like to do. Uh, our editor is hoping to put you on the cover of Time magazine, which we don't put very many football coaches right, on the cover yeah. of Time magazine. It had been many years. I think, uh, I think the Notre Dame coach uh, had been on previous to, to him, not very many, Newt Rockney was on the cover at the time. Mm -hmm. Football coaches, the Vince Lombardi was on the cover at the time. Right. Football coaches don't regularly appear on the cover at the time. And we hit it off, and I told him what I wanted to do. Now, this picture, this is probably the best example I can give you about learning from one's mistakes and sometimes not mistakes. Sure, yeah. uh, some, some of them weren't mistakes. I came up with this idea of shooting what would appear a double exposure like a, a score, uh, like a chalkboard right. that all coaches used. In 19, uh, it was the Baltimore Colts were playing in the championship game. I, I don't remember the year. I think it was 63, but I'm not 100% sure. But the idea, 64, sorry. The Colts were going to play, the Baltimore Colts were going to play the Cleveland Browns, Jimmy Brown's team, in the NFL championship game. This is three or four years before the Super Bowl was invented. So this was the big game. This was the World Series of professional football. And it had become, after the Joe Namath win in Super Bowl three, it had become a big deal. I'm sorry. After the, uh, the early pack of wins, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the frozen field in Green Bay, uh, it had become... Not the World Series, but it was certainly on par with the World Series. Today, I think it's certainly the biggest sporting event mm -hmm. we have. But what happened was our writer, Tex Mall, had made a deal with the coach of the Baltimore Colts. And it was a Don Jula. And the Colts were such a good team. They were a prohibitive favorite. I don't know whether they were 10 or, or, or two touchdown favorites to beat the Colts. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, I'm sorry, to beat the Browns. Mm -hmm. And Sports Illustrated had decided that they were they were going to put Coach Shula on the cover of the magazine with Johnny Unitas, who was the star quarterback of the team, uh, and the heading to the piece after the game. Mm-hmm. The piece was written before the game. All one had to do was put the opening paragraph in as to what the score was, but it was by Don Shula, and the piece was entitled How We Beat how we beat the Browns, uh-huh. how we won the title, or whatever. And I shot Johnny Unitas and Coach Coach Shula through a pane of glass with the plays written on it, and it was a beautiful cover. It got laid out. I think it actually went as far as getting engraved in those days, how we won the title. Mm-hmm. Well, Unfortunately, the Cleveland Browns won the game 34 to nothing. Oh. <laughs> so needless to say, Sports Illustrated, that cover yeah, never that cover, got yeah. anywhere. So that didn't work. But I'd also, it was hard to like because you, you one getting the depth of field between the coach, right. the, between the players and the glass, and two, mm-hmm. if you lit the players the way you really wanted to light them, and I was still learning about lighting, but if you lit the players the way you wanted to light them, you got a great picture of the players, but you had glare on the glass. If Mm -hmm. you lit the glass the way you wanted it, you had lousy lighting on the players. So I tried it again a couple of years later uh, with coach, uh, again with a coach, and then Lou Alcinda, later on, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, had just been uh, his freshman year at, uh, at UCLA. Mm-hmm. And Johnny Wooden was the most famous basketball coach in the country. And Sports Illustrated wanted to do a cover on, on Alcinda. And I posed Coach Wooden with, uh, with Alcinda. This time, Wooden wrote the plays. Mm-hmm. And I improved it a little. I figured out a little bit of how to get less glare on the, you know, how to get the light, light better on the subjects and the glare you know, better on the glass. Anyway, but it was a good picture. The problem was Coach Wooden one of the nicest human beings you'd ever meet in your life and, and a fun guy until you turned the camera on him in which case he turned wooden mm-hmm. so the picture quite frankly wasn't very good and yeah. we ended up running Alcinda by himself uh-huh. uh, the odd part is that cover ran when Coach Wooden died in 2002 or whatever sports and one of the years earlier last 10 years of uh, uh, ended up Tell's coming back yeah. put it on the cover but that picture died uh-huh. then I tried it with Fran Tarkenton who was the quarterback of uh, of the Minnesota Vikings and I got it a little bit better and I was beginning to see you needed a dark shirt you needed whatever I knew you needed a dark background right. and uh, I tried it one other time I think and then we came up with Time, Time Magazine wanted to do Coach Bryant and he had the perfect face uh-huh. the perfect subject unlike Coach Wooden this guy lit up when you put a camera on him I mean that face uh-huh. and, that, and yeah. his houndstooth hat and, right. uh, and I figured it out but I had absolutely by then figured out how to solve the problem of the glass the and technical the technical problem field, yep. mm-hmm. and it was to do a double exposure oh. so I took a Hasselblad two Hasselblads on a tripod Coach Wooden sat where you are uh-huh. and I had a stand set up right over here uh huh with the plays on it. He had uh-huh. written, I had left the hole in the middle where his face would be, oh. and he had, he had put the plays, he wrote the plays on it for me. I see. And with a Hasselblad, you could do a double exposure. I could like you exactly the way I wanted to like you, and I could like the glass, but I would take frame one of you, yep. then I would take the back off the camera without winding it, put it on this camera shoot the plays wow I now had one piece of film with both plays on it then I would shoot the plays again go back to shooting you and I went back and forth for I don't know two rolls of film or whatever double exposure and that was it yeah so I would have never guessed that no photoshop no photoshop (laughs) back in those days it was difficult to yeah edit those photos and then uh, you know like I said these are your your, some portraits here's Don King Uh, obviously you're using lots of lighting Um, you you know I, I Back in the day, were you using these big packs? Like, did you have a lot of gear on these, a lot of assistants, or was it relatively yeah, well, low-key? Well, one assistant usually, but this was in a studio, and you just set up, and it's really once, you know, there's certain subjects that are impossible to miss with. Uh, this guy, very hard to miss. Right. <laughs> Don King. I'm sure you saw a lot of him in your day. Yeah, and, and, you know, you asked me a bit ago about why I could get the kind of access. You know, well, not only did I do this with Don King, and it was the first major PC that I'd done, but I put him on the cover of Sports Illustrated, and I say I did because the assignment was to put Joe Fraser and Muhammad Ali on. 
I said it would be a much better cover with Don King in it, and the cover of the magazine was this pre- preceded uh, Super Bowl, uh, uh, the fight, the thriller in Manila. Oh, but I put Ali, Manila, Fraser, right. and Don King on the cover together. Right. So Don sort of liked me, and I guess in a funny way felt he owed me something. Very nice. Well, it's all about working those connections. All right, uh, another one of your famous portrait series. This was actually, this was done not for Sports Illustrated. This was Time done for magazine, Time Magazine. Yeah. I moved to Time Magazine in 1979, the beginning 79. of 79. Okay. And, uh, you know, and, and we would do an Olympic preview. Uh, the competition, of course, was Newsweek, except our editor was a man named Ray Cave who had grown up on Sports Illustrated with me. We both wanted to show Sports Illustrated the proper way to cover an Olympics, and time could spend the money. And I did 14 athletes around the world. Again, no Photoshop. <laughs> this was the rings are hanging from a crane. From right. A, from oh, a crane, yeah. A little uh-huh. crane that I had over, and I did this at Mount Fuji. So the concept was to get all of the top athletes from each country in front of their famous landmark. Exactly, with one exception. Everything was a landmark. So I did a Greek uh, Greek javelin throw in front of the Parthenon, an Egyptian in front of the pyramids, a boxer, an Italian boxer in front of the Colosseum. I did a Chinese gymnast on the Great Wall, and I did Koji Gush again at Mount Fuji, who won the gold medal and all around. But we, at the time, the you know, it took a year to do this thing, and uh, they still hadn't decided whether to retaliate for Jimmy Carter mm-hmm. boycotting the 1980 games. What happened eventually was uh, uh, Russia... Uh, East Germany uh, boycotted boycotted Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was going to preview the LA Olympics, but one of the best teams in the world was Cuba, and we had hoped that uh, you know the Cubans would would come. They Castro hadn't announced yet what they were going to do, but I pitched the idea to the Cubans that uh, Fidel Castro was to Cuba what the Colosseum was to Rome, <laughs> what the pyramids were to Egypt. He would be the only non-athlete. And we ended up using uh, using. I uh, took a great the, picture the boxer with Teofilo with the, Stevenson. So I don't have that photo, but I do have the photo that uh, you made for fun after the fact. Well, this well, was, uh, this I, was really quite something. Uh, <laughs> I'd know, say Eddie Adams. Eddie Adams had photographed Castro a month or two before I went uh-huh. for Parade magazine for a cover on Parade, and he had, like me, he always took a picture with the subject mm-hmm. at the end of a shoot, and he had this hilarious picture of Fidel Castro and Eddie Adams in duck hunting outfits with rifles. I remember right this Right next photo, to yep. each other. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, you can imagine what the CIA thought when they saw that one. <laughs> what an opportunity. <laughs> right. Arnold Drapkin was the picture editor of Time, and Arnold told me, you'll never get a picture this good. And I made him a $100 bet that I'd get a better one. And I had this idea. That's incredible. And Castro loved it. <laughs> well, when I was go- what was funny is when I was going through your archives, I saw the photo of, of the boxer and, and he holding up the hands that you were talk- referencing earlier. And I was thinking... And it's then a I great saw, boxer. I, three-time I, Olympic gold medal winning Teofilo Stevenson. So. And then uh, I, I saw a, a portrait, a headshot, of Fidel, and I thought, hmm, I wonder what this relationship was. I wonder if he was just, I, I didn't know yet. And then I started going through your archives, and then this photo pops up. I'm like, holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> he has a relationship. All right, let's get back to where we were. Uh, okay, so now we're getting into, um, so you were a little bit in your day kind of pigeonholed a bit into being like a sports photographer because you shot, shot so much sports but you're a photojournalist and, and you moved to Life Magazine or Time and Life and we're shooting photojournalistic type type work as well so I wanted to show a couple photos that aren't necessarily sports well I started out this by the so way was the, taken yeah. when I was probably 13 or 14 years right. old I used to build a little plastic model ships and I was you know, I wanted to be my high school yearbook says well, I wanted to be a naval aviator oh, yeah. I wanted to fly on and off aircraft carriers and I and I would I lived right opposite the Brooklyn Navy Yard and I would photograph the ships coming in and out of the yard this was probably done from the Manhattan Bridge walkway I'm looking at the picture and uh it was just fun to do. Uh, it looks like I didn't amazing. really get pigeonholed into sports photography. You know, as a kid, I was a huge sports fan. Yeah. I mean, I was a rabid Brooklyn Dodger fan when the Dodgers were still in Brooklyn. Right. Uh, you know, I got very keen on football as football began. I loved boxing. Uh, you know, to wake and, and photography was a hobby and, and a hobby that I really liked quite a bit. The idea of someone paying me to go to the World Series and sit in the best seat in the house and do something I enjoyed doing sure. was a joke. I used to pinch myself, you know, how could I get this lucky? Mm-hmm. 
So it wasn't really pigeonholed, but I always wanted to do other things as well. Right. So uh, you had a fascination for warships, and when you were, uh, I believe you were over with life at this point, right? When you shot this? Well, this was, I was already freelancing. I had left time. Freelancing, okay. And so you, you were able to go to the Gulf... And, and photograph. I mean, you have a whole series, you know, on yeah. on ships, aircraft carriers. Um. Well, Life magazine, Life magazine folded. It's weekly magazine folded in 1972, and uh, they played around with various different approaches and ended up with a monthly magazine. Mm-hmm. When the first Gulf War happened, Jim Gaines was the managing editor of Life at the time, and Jim wanted to go weekly, and he talked the powers that be at Time, Inc., into publishing life as a weekly magazine. Mm -hmm. Not an oversized magazine. It was the same size as Time or Sports Illustrated, but a weekly magazine. And uh, they approached me. David Friend was the director of photography, but he was staying in New York because the whole magazine to put out besides just the Gulf War. But they were going to do a weekly magazine during as long as the war went. And Mm -hmm. they approached me about being the director of photography in Saudi Arabia for life. So I would basically get the film, or in this case, the digital discs. Uh-huh. And uh, and I had an assistant because I am sort of semi-computer literate. But <laughs> nothing would have ever gotten in New York if it was just me. <laughs> but they did send someone with me. And uh, and I, so I was in Saudi Arabia when the war ended. Uh-huh. What happened was... Uh, Every photographer in, in, in Dahran, which is where the main press base was, it's where all the broadcasts, the, the anchors were uh, Peter Jennings and Tom Brokaw. You'd see these guys from the news. That's where they were broadcasting from. The minute the war ended and they opened up to the press because they had kept the press out of Kuwait, every journalist with a camera left Dahran to go to, uh, into, in, into Kuwait uh-huh. to see the damage. Well... The Marines traditionally uh, do an overflight over whatever this, the scene of the victory that they had just... This goes back to a Marine air wing flying over uh, the Arc de Triomphe when, 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 mm-hmm. when they liberated Paris. It goes over Japan. And there was a bulletin up on the wall that they would be flying a formation of, of F-18s over the, uh, over the oil fields and over whatever. And I... Signed up. I'll was sign up for that one. Well, there were yeah. no photographers there. There wasn't a photographer for me to sign, and, and this happened, uh, and that's when this was taken. I bet that was a pretty incredible flight. The most incredible thing I've ever seen, and you couldn't get it really in a picture because the sky got so black. For there were a thousand, you know, the, yeah. what, what the retreating Iraqis had done was light, was light oh. up all of the oil wells, and it was the most. It was an incredible sight. So this is an F-18 actually coming in. To to uh, to refuel. Mm-hmm. From, I was in one of those KC one thirty five tankers. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so also while you were there, right? Um, no, this, this was uh, this was in uh, Vietnam. This was oh wow. This I, is you know having ago. having shot all these ships as a kid, and I mean as a kid, as a twelve year old, thirteen year old, a fourteen year old. I read a piece in. Uh, I was an established photographer by this point, but I certainly wasn't getting uh, big assignments from Life magazine. Uh, on non-sports things. Life was sending me to shoot some sports stories, but they weren't sending me on non-sports stories. Uh, I read one day, just coming into town, uh, that uh, the the Navy had decided, the Defense Secretary had decided to bring back a battleship. There hadn't been a battleship in commission since the Korean War. Mm -hmm. And it was the New Jersey, one Mm -hmm. of the ships I had photographed as a 12 or 13 year old and had built a little model of. I went right to the picture editor of life and I proposed that it would be really fun to do a piece called Mothballs to Vietnam. (laughs) The ship was being brought back to bomb North Vietnam, which is what we were doing at the time. And uh, I don't think I had a prayer of getting the assignment until I told them what my fee would be. And I gave them such a ridiculously low... The ship was in Philadelphia, uh-huh. and it would take almost a year to bring it out of mothballs. But I said I would go down there periodically. I would take a flat rate, and I would end up... I wanted to end up on the gun line in, uh, in Vietnam. Oh, my gosh. And uh, as I said, I gave them... I, I made them an offer they couldn't say no to. It was the <laughs> cheapest... <laughs> and... So I spent a year photographing the New Jersey, went through the Panama Canal, went through, you know, with Life magazine credentials. Right. 
And these were taken in Vietnam. And one of the things uh, I remember as a young photographer, Mark Kaufman, a great life photographer, telling me there is no better training ground for any kind of photography. Maybe that wouldn't apply to fashion, but certainly photojournalism, uh, certainly covering the news, which I put to good use at Time magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, then the training you get in sports photography. There's an immediacy, there's no second chance. There are all those things. And the techniques that I used, the sequence cameras, there was a camera called a Hulcher. In those 35 millimeter Hulcher, it was a 70 millimeter Hulcher also, but this was a 35 millimeter Hulcher. You'd put a 100 foot roll of Kodachrome in it and you could shoot at 50 frames a second. Oh my gosh. Which meant when they shot the guns, you got the shells every single time. People Incredible. look at it and say, wow. I was boy, wondering it's quick. about that, actually. Yeah. Well, when the guns are about to go off the big guns, there's a three second warning. So I was sitting up on the forecastle of the ship. This was five miles off the North Vietnamese coast. Uh -huh. Looks very peaceful there, but this was literally <laughs> five miles off North Vietnam. Right. And uh, we, uh, it, there'd be a signal at, at three seconds, there's a buzzer that goes off just in case somebody is where they shouldn't be right. to protect your ears or whatever. Right. I would sort of count down a second or a second and a half if I could start the motor drive. And I got the shells, as they say, every time they fired. So this is one of them. This is a scene, your eye really doesn't see this. It happens so fast, the white flame or the bullets, you don't really see. Right. What you see is, I think you have another frame. Next. Oh, no, but I don't have that frame, actually. Well, actually, what you see is fire. It's red. Right. I used it as the cover of a book that yeah. I did. Uh, but it was, it was probably the easiest picture. But it's taking the same <laughs> technique that you would use in sports. Uh -huh. I did a lot of pictures like that where yeah. I used the same technique that I learned in it's sports uh, There's a cover. I did a cover on prisons in America where I shot exactly. Well, this, this is the picture from it, which I'll get right. to. But the cover of the magazine was exactly it was the... Uh, uh, the Ollie Williams picture. I put a camera right. directly in the center so everything was symmetrical of a prison cell and shot down on, a, on a, somebody in a cell. This was part of the prison essay. This was Charles Manson. And yeah. to my knowledge, I think I'm right about this also. He has never been photographed ever in his cell. This is in his cell. Uh huh. Uh, and, uh, this was a prison called Vacaville. He's been interviewed now. I mean, Geraldo was interviewed, sure. him and many other uh, Barbara Walters, I think, may have interviewed him once. But they've always they've always done the interviews in a in a uh, interview room. They bring the inmate to a room and they sit down like we're sitting down, and uh, never one in his cell. This was in. I spent a day with him, and this picture was taken in his cell. The stick he has in his hand was the way he changed channels on his television. Oh, really? His remote, huh? Right. Um, so did you enjoy more or less shooting uh, sports versus more documentary photojournalism? I mean, I know that's a hard well, I question. Lo well, I loved shooting sports. No, no, I don't want to. I don't want to understate that. But I mean, I, you know, one of the great things, one of the great advantages I had is the more successful I was, the more I could call the shots on what I wanted to shoot. I sort of earned the right to say no. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't do things I didn't want to do, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed both very much. Whatever I shot was something I had wanted to do in most instances that I had asked to do. Yeah. Um, I want to uh, jump back. Uh, we're going to look at some, some more fun picks uh, here in a second. But I want to jump back to growing up and, and getting into photography again, because we've gone over these photos in, in pretty great detail. Thank you for that. Um, but you grew up here in Manhattan on the Lower East Side, mm -hmm. way back in the day. Well, I grew up on the Lower East Side at a time when, you know, uh, the opportunity to learn something like photography without having any money was was there. There was a place called the Henry Street Settlement House, which was really to keep kids off the street. Johnny Iacona uh -huh. and I were we both started taking pictures together there, and they had a you know they had programs. Uh, if you wanted to learn to play piano, mm -hmm. they had piano lessons. Kids in the Lower East Side couldn't afford a piano. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to dance, the girls would take ballet. Right. I liked, I really wanted to go to the gym and play basketball. You know, I thought one day I'd be tall, but I wanted to go to the gym and play basketball. But, you know, uh, you could only do so many things each night. And one of the things they had was a photography club, which I joined. And the mm -hmm. person who taught it, you know, it was two days a week, uh, just made photography fun. Yeah. And uh, let's say we had one point, 
we had three staff photographers on Sports Illustrated, Johnny Iacona, Manny Milan, and myself, uh-huh. all of whom started at this club at the same time. Incredible. And Look Magazine had two photographers, uh, Mickey Palmer and uh, Vinny Nanfra, both who were in the same camera club. That was pretty cool. That's pretty incredible. Pretty, yeah. They really. all grew up together. All and poor kids who couldn't. The settlement house would provide you with a camera. There was some company that donated cameras. Uh, they don't exist anymore. I think the company was called De Jour. Uh-huh. And they would donate these little 35 millimeter cameras or two and a quarter cameras. And, uh, and Life Photo Lab, among others, and Kodak, would send down outdated film. It was just slightly, it was, the film was perfectly fine Uh and that's how we could because you know buying a roll of film would have been enough to keep me out of the camera club yeah certainly buying two rolls and what you would do is go out on the weekend and shoot a roll of film Mm -hmm. uh wherever the bronx zoo uh times square whatever you wanted to shoot Mm -hmm. uh and the christmas tree at times square was always a favorite we'd have an annual contest as to who could take the most creative picture of the christmas tree at times square and it was amazing how you got young kids thinking about not the straight on shot maybe i'll see it reflected in a window or in Mm -hmm. a puddle or uh or there'll be one of those hot dog vendors in the foreground, and the tree will be secondary to it. Yeah. Maybe I'll talk my way into the, in those days, you could just get an elevator and go to upstairs the and floor. to the top floor and look straight down with right. the skating rink and uh, whatever. And I really enjoyed all of that, but you'd shoot a roll of film. You either had Monday and Wednesday or Tuesday and Thursday were your nights. And uh-huh. You'd go out and shoot a roll of film. And she would, uh, the lady who ran the club would help you, teach you how to develop it into negatives. Uh And then the next day you would make a print or two, all of which you didn't have to pay for. Actually, it's not. I think we had to pay 10 cents a sheet of paper. And the reason was they wanted to teach you not to waste Waste paper. You had to learn how to to do it right. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, so... I want to uh, pull up this photo here. This is a, at uh, Shea Stadium here. Yes. And this is back when you were with Life. No, no Sports Illustrated. This okay, so this was just the Life oh, lens. Life owned the lens. Okay. This lens was Explain used Explain this around. lens to me. <laughs> well, it was one of a kind. Life magazine had bought it, had had it, I think, designed by... Uh, uh, Astro was the name of the company that made the lens, German company and what they wanted to do in those days no press were permitted at Cape Canaveral which is now Cape Kennedy where the, where uh-huh. the space program was uh-huh. beginning Life magazine the weekly life in the you know, this is before the first Sputnik you know, mm-hmm. wanted to be able to photograph these missile tests they used to do it from the beach at Cocoa Beach, which was, I don't know, seven miles away or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they had this lens made. Uh, Ralph Morse used it. It was on a 70 millimeter. I, I think I'm using a 70 millimeter hulture on it. Uh, you could also put it on a 35 millimeter camera, but you could do it on a 70 millimeter camera, which shot, and uh, that camera, I believe, shot 20 frames a second. So and what were I you was shooting, shooting the well, batter? Well, today, yeah, I was trying to shoot the batter. We were doing a Willie Mays cover. And I was assigned to shoot Willie Mays, and I wanted to do, you know, today you see this on television every game, the center field camera. Right. But I thought it was fun to do, you know, to do a little different picture of Willie where you'd see the catcher and the umpire mm-hmm. and Willie. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it wasn't anywhere near the quality of today's lenses. And, of course, the size of it, the lens, the lens cap, lens shade, lens shade yeah. was four feet. Oh. So, you know, it came in three boxes. It was pretty fabulous. And it used to always... And of course, you could see I'm not very tall, so you know, there I had to stand on a box. <laughs> a and box we, on a box on a station wagon. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, it, now, did you say what the focal length was on this sucker? 2,000 millimeter. 2,000 2, millimeter. millimeter. Yeah. And your uh, and aperture it was, it was, was probably a, like, I don't know, probably pretty low. I think it was F11, if I remember. F11. It. But, you know, uh, you could you could get a picture. It Daylight. Was, uh, yeah. Games, I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I had a couple of pictures published with it, but I never really nailed it. And, I mean, today, you yeah. can do this with your eyes closed. Yeah, yeah. Um, we move over to, to this shot, which is uh, actually Super Bowl X in right. Miami with a bunch of characters here. Well, you have the great Barton Silverman. In Barton the Silverman, left, bottom uh, left. There he is, yeah. There. Bottom left, Ken Regan, uh, Wally McNamee, myself, Herb Sharfman, Walter Yost, the top row. Jim Drake, Heinz Klutmeyer, Johnny Iacona, and one of our assistants, uh, Anthony Donna, is the guy kneeling just just next to Barton. Wow. And and so look at this this camera he's got here. Uh, do you have any idea what that is? Yeah, that was my camera. Oh, <laughs> that was your camera. <laughs> that was that was a uh, Zeiss 1000. Life, you know, these things were really this was made for the, for, you know, 
for the, whatever their secret service is uh-huh. and FBI. The Israelis, I think, own more of them at one time than anybody else. It was an absolutely tax shop. Uh-huh. Uh, F... I was going to say 5.6. It might have been F5. Uh-huh. Thousand millimeter mirror lens. But it was a fabulous lens. It had zero depth of field. But boy, when you nailed it, it was beautiful. <laughs> and I, I, I loved it. I did a bunch of things with it over the years. And so did Walter. Walter Yos got really keen on the lens. It weighed 80 pounds. I mean, you needed somebody to between carry the tripod and the lens. You know, it didn't take a little tripod. It had to be in one of the heavy-duty Gitzo tripods. Yeah. So this brings me to another topic. You know, you're you're with these are the the types of people that you're with shooting sports on a regular basis. Obviously, um, this is a special event. Obviously, the Super Bowl. Um, but you guys had a, a, a fun relationship. Um, you know, working all these games together. I heard. I, you, I think so. But uh, both competitive, and I, I've heard of heard of some pranks you guys used to play on one another. You know, it's you, you put a bunch of guys in a hotel for a week, what's going to happen? You know, that's what I heard. I don't think that's changed at all. I mean, you'd have to ask Al that to know whether or not it's the same, but we <laughs> spent a lot of time having fun. You yeah. know? Well, if you go, for example, if you, you went to any of the, the World Series, uh, the Olympics, uh, everyone is in the same hotel, in the same bar at night. And, right. uh, yeah, some pranks would happen. I was pretty good at it. I heard they Johnny were, Iacona was very good at it. I heard. This is this is what I heard. I heard a couple a couple of these pranks. I don't know if we wanted to bring them up on this, but uh, I but I heard they were kind of like Three Stooges sort of pranks. You know, like uh, I heard one about uh, Johnny specifically getting a, a hotel room with a balcony above. Maybe you. Or that some. wasn't me. No, Johnny did some. Of the, well, uh, the one, the one that really stands out is Go for it. Uh, without telling you a story that would take half an hour to tell. <laughs> they made the mistake of messing with the wrong guy when they they sort of something about did shrimp under in. your bed. They was that filled what it was? my bed at the Super Bowl with shrimp. I don't eat fish. And <laughs> if I hadn't, and I had a cold, I couldn't smell anything. If I hadn't. If they hadn't gotten a little overzealous and some of the shrimp blood uh, oh, gross. seeped through the pillowcase and I, but try to get your room changed the night before the Super Bowl, that isn't happening. So I, I uh, you know, I used to tell Johnny, uh, Johnny, had, Johnny had 150 IQ when it came to practical jokes. Uh-huh. And I said, but I'm a little better. Don't mess <laughs> and, and he did. I know he was one of the culprits. And so was my boss at the time, Jerry Cook. I waited one year. And then I got a fake arrest. I had a friend who was a policeman in Dade County and his buddy. I still remember when I went down and proposed this to this cop. And I said, hey, do you guys ever do any, like, fake arrests? <laughs> to which he replied every Saturday, every Friday and Saturday night. <laughs> and I, uh, I waited for the credential the night before the Super Bowl, or two, two days before the Super Bowl, Jerry Cook would have, we had a little cocktail party and Walter and I hosted this one, Yos. Yep. And uh, that's when the credentials were going to be given out. And uh, at a certain point I left and said I had to go back and call my wife. It was too noisy in the room. And of course I brought both cops in and uh, the cops came in and it takes a long time to arrest 25 people. <laughs> but uh, he took all the names and the room was silent. Uh, by the way, the place reeked of marijuana. <laughs> and Sports Illustrated had had some drug problems. Uh, with uh, There was no, you know, it, had, it was pretty clear anybody ever involved in anything like this was going to get fired. Right. Uh, the highlight of it was when the cop frisked Jerry Cook and found this big envelope full of the credentials. <laughs> and Jerry, uh, he said, uh, "Can I ha- give me those. The cop said, oh, we'll take those. And Jerry replied, I can't give you those. These are the credentials uh, for the game. And the cop just looked at Jerry and said, well, you won't be needing those. Court doesn't open until Monday morning. Oh, my God. <laughs> so they also, their life flash, and then and it ended with the cop saying to them, but you guys come down, you city slickers from New York come down here and think you can make fools of us, us country bumpkins in, in Miami. Right. This is in uh, at the Doral Hotel in Miami. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said, so bring, they, he made everybody face the window with their back to the door. He said, let's bring in the Miami Herald photographer, oh, okay. which was, of course, me. <laughs> and I came in and I really learned I learned something then is you can't take very good pictures when you're laughing so hard at, at, at his 60th because the camera was jumping but I did get the whole scene photographed and of that's course, an amazing story no one messed with me no one's messed with me since yeah I wouldn't mess with you since that that's incredible alright good story good times and you know you have the arrival so this was 
uh, you guys were all working together on this. Was this the Super Well, no. no I mean, Barton was, was with the Times. the Times. Ken Regan and Wally were working for Newsweek. This was just, we were, again, yeah. we all traveled to the same events over and over again and had become friends, you know, on a personal level for many years. Uh, it was a logical just logical and you uh, kind of had like a, a bit of a competition between them I would imagine sure, you, you know you sure. don't want back back in the uh, I mean obviously there were wires when obviously I, I've shot some some of this kind of stuff for the New York Times you know Super Bowl 45 or something like that and everything's different now but you're always worried about the wires getting the better photos and you not getting it because then they'll just use the wires over yours and, and so there's a real like well you know I mean I, I was more worried about about the photographers that were shooting for the magazine now uh, you know, uh, the football in particular, where we would have, depending on the game, anywhere from two to six or eight photographers that we got to the championship game. And, you know, we had some pretty good shooters. Uh, you know, I, I always had tremendous respect for Jim Drake and for Walter Yost. These were guys who weren't going to miss. Mm -hmm. You weren't hoping that you get a better picture because they had a bad day. They didn't have bad days. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'd have an exceptional day. There's a big difference. But they didn't have bad days. So you really just... You really just had to take better pictures, right? Um, so moving moving on, uh, you're now like we said a, a filmmaker, and this is where I last saw you before today. Was it uh, the premiere of your? Uh, was this the latest one? This is my latest. The one, latest yes. one, the Keep Keepers of the Streak, which is uh, about these four photographers that um, have photographed every Super Bowl. Right or the last well, 48. we did this and, and this uh, the film. Keep, yeah, Keepers of the Street was about four photographers: Walter Yost, John, John Beaver, Beaver yeah. Mickey Palmer, and Tony Tomczyk. Mm -hmm. And they had photographed every single Super Bowl, going into the one we just had this year. Sadly, Tony Tomczyk uh, had a, a minor stroke. He's in great shape now, mm -hmm. but he missed this year. So next year there'll only be three photographers three, yeah. that have gone to all of them. But I proposed a documentary to ESPN on the four photographers, and ESPN was smart enough to make a, uh, a co-production out of it with the NFL Films. So oh, I had un unlimited access, oh, really, man. to the Super Bowl at, uh, at the yeah. Meadowlands and oh. footage. Yeah. And I mean, credentials, uh, I think I had 14 credentials in the Super Bowl. Yeah. You know, each of these guys had an assistant. Uh, Walter was the only one. Walter and John were shooting for Sports Illustrated. So Mickey, Mickey, back in the day, was doing all the, the baseball cards, right? Was that Mickey? Yes, yes. And, and I, I heard this funny story how you were fo showing his photos in your movie and he hasn't shot a single horizontal, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> well, everything's I, I said, Mickey, you do know that the uh, television screen, is it's a horizontal format. Right. Where are the horizontals? Well, you know, he, he, shot, he shot baseball and football. He shot mainly, uh, I mean... The quarterbacks, uh, he had every great quarterback of the last 50 years, not a single horizontal picture of any of them. Right. But it, it works. You can, you can show vertical pictures on television. <laughs> you can. You can it's make it work. It's just the horizontals just look better. Right. Um, now, you've, this is one of, I don't know, you've done about eight? or you've done How many films have you done? You've done shorts? You've done, done features? I've done quite a few. I've done a couple of films for, uh, for HBO Sports. Right. I did uh, two for HBO documentaries. One uh -huh. of them got shortlisted for an Academy Award. Nothing to do with sports. Uh, the star of the film was former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a film. I did a film for HBO for Sheila Nevins at HBO, on and this sounds like an oxymoron, but it really is isn't, on on three blind photographers. Oh wow! And it was fascinating. Uh, just a fascinating story. Yeah. And it was a you know a one hour documentary for for HBO. So, so I've done quite a few things. So when like when and why did you start getting the interest in in motion motion film? There's an old adage. You know, I said it much earlier in in, in our in our chat today, I said that uh, Sylvester Stallone put both my kids through college. Right. I used to, to freelance, uh, you know, I was, I was going through a divorce and uh -huh. alimony and child support, and my yeah. kids were getting ready for school, mm -hmm. and while I was treated very well at Time Inc., I certainly had no complaints about what they were paying me. I needed more money, yeah. and I would freelance and do movie stills, and there's an old adage about movies, sports-related films. Not only did I shoot the Rocky films for Stallone, right. I shot Sly High at me to do the dance sequence in Staying Alive. Uh -huh. He wanted action. Travolta was playing the character again it was a sequel to Saturday yeah. Night Fever and I shot that but I also shot Rollerball with Jimmy Kahn I shot uh, wow. I shot two or three of Burt Reynolds films including Semi-Tough and Longest Yard I'd get hired to do the football game 
Uh-huh. I shot Meryl Streep later on uh, in River Wild, the uh-huh. rafting sequences. Uh-huh. The whole idea, you know, was to take a sports photographer who could shoot the action and get what they wanted. Uh, so, so that you was your work intro. on film sets. You work on film sets, and there is a there's an old adage: one of two things happen. You either fall asleep or you fall in love. Oh. I fell in love. You know, uh-huh. it's like watching grass grow, particularly on big budget Hollywood oh, yeah. films. Everything goes so Same thing slowly. over and over and but, over. Yeah. But I fell in love with the process, whereas years ago I used to think what I really liked about still photography, and this might sound egotistical, I never thought of it that way, but I liked the fact that it, it's, it's you. Right. Yeah, you have an assistant helping you with the lights, but I determine where the lights are going. Right. Uh, it's not a director of photography who may be better at this than I would be in film. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're not dealing with music. You're not dealing with a script. You're not dealing with actors. You're dealing with you. If you like a picture that I took, you're looking at him. Right. If you don't like it, you're looking at him too. Right. Film is much more of a collaborative right. effort. You gotta you have to have you have to have what you want to do is hire a whole bunch of people who are better at what they do than you could ever be at their thing and motivate them to do a great job. And I just fell in love with the process and I'm enjoying it now. So um, are you when you're doing these films, are you more in a capacity where you're shooting or are you directing a bunch of people to do oh, I've what never you want? shot. I honestly don't know how to use a film camera. I know how to compose the frame. But again, it's very tricky. The cameraman is the biggest problem I have often. I've been using a guy named Peter Francella, who has won, I think, 12 Emmys for cinematography, shot tons of stuff for ESPN, and keeps winning the sports Emmy. Uh, oh, yeah. Director. Mm-hmm. Well, he's really good, you know. If you He shot Keepers of the Street for me, Peter okay, Francella. Yeah. Well, if you're looking over his shoulder and telling him how to frame every shot and how to light, well, I don't like the lighting here, you know, you don't get somebody that talented. He right. doesn't want somebody to tell him how to shoot everything. Right. Uh, so I've never shot a thing, and I honestly don't know how to. I wouldn't know how to use a video camera. I know how to. I know when I don't like the lighting. I don't know. I know when I want it a little tighter or a little wider. But I try to sort of let the cameramen do what they do. Except when I really am convinced something should be done, I'll put my two cents in. But the rest of it, uh, you know, I direct and produce. I don't. Uh, I don't do anything else. And of course. As producer and director, you're responsible for the editing of the film. You're hiring you're hiring all the different people. But the guy who does my music forgot more about music than I know. The guy who edits my films, the lady who edits my films, a wonderful editor, uh, who edited Keepers of the Street, just much more, uh, much more able as an yeah. editor than I am. But I have ideas of what I want, and I... I'm not yeah. quiet about it. Uh, yeah, that's that's the way to go. So I'm going to pull up a few of these photos here. Uh, our, our mutual friend David Bergman uh, sent yeah. me sent me some photos from some previous shoots. Uh, so you meant you've been hanging out with uh, Muhammad Ali for you know years, fifty well, years this almost. Is, this and, is Ali. Ali turned seventy uh, three years ago in mm-hmm. January. He's and he uh, we decided uh, Sports Illustrated we're actually going to put him on the cover of the magazine. Uh-huh. And, and the NFL playoffs were at the time, and it just something something just knocked him off but I photographed him at, at his home in Arizona uh-huh. this was in January of 73 and and then David was my assistant at the London Olympics uh-huh. during uh, David by the way is a very accomplished oh, yeah. photographer when <laughs> I say he was my assistant he was doing gigapans of all the events right. I worked on the Today Show so uh-huh. it was kind of a boondoggle because all of the people that appear in the Today Show they start off they start off with uh, with makeup and hair and wardrobe right. and then they bring them into pose for me right and then bring them to the set I right. had a little studio set up so it was pretty cool I got to hang out with the uh, Olympic w- w- women's team um, did a shoot with some of them as well um, so very cool so um, I'm just going to leave up let's see here let's leave up this uh, awesome shot of you with the lens okay um, so I, you know we've gone through all these photos we've talked a lot one of the things that we didn't really cover too much is just uh, in general business. I know we mentioned freelancing. You've you started as a freelancer, obviously, right? Mm-hmm. You you sold your photos, um, and then you moved into staff positions. Now, do you? Uh, and, and one other thing that I want to mention is, you know, there's different points in your career where you're, you make these different decisions. So as I'm going through your archives, you know, I'm making selections, and your archives, you actually have sold off and and they are run by Time Life now Sports Illustrated or Sports Illustrated right and uh, so so at this point you've just sort of like okay I want to move in this direction shooting films I don't want to have to deal with this 
just here you go. Well, what happened? What happened? I always enjoyed being creative, and the the fun part were doing assignments. Whether it's an assignment to make a film, or whether whether it's an assignment to shoot still pictures, a cover of the magazine. As I began selling prints in galleries. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a gallery at Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas that was just called the Neil Life Gallery. Believe it or not, business started going very well. Mm -hmm. And if money were my motive, I would still be doing it myself. Right. I did better by myself than because I'm just a small part of Sports Illustrated. Right. Uh, Karen Carpenter, who handles my pictures at Sports Illustrated, has a much bigger job than just my pictures. Who has helped me out with this. Thank you so much, Karen, by the way. Well, Karen and Joe, and Joe Felice, yeah. who are the two people that deal with my pictures. But I was running a business, and I was running it, much to my surprise, fairly successfully. Well, I will tell you, I'd walk from my... I work out of my home, mm -hmm. and I have an office the apartment right next to my apartment which has an entrance I can go through both apartments I'd walk the 50 feet maybe from my bedroom to my office in the morning mm -hmm. and I hated going to work I mean I really the first time in my life I, I was becoming more and more of a businessman uh, somebody would complain that there was a kink in the print they just got uh, someone else said uh, they didn't understand that we were going to crop the picture well it was always cropped on my website, but they didn't understand that. They didn't want that. Somebody else had uh, uh, wanted it on, uh, they wanted a Cibachrome when I'm printing C prints. So, you know. Yeah, customers, you know. I yeah. just, but I don't want to be a businessman. Yeah. And uh, to me, having, I'm very lucky to have Karen and Joe handling my pictures at SI. I, I make a little less money, but I wake up in the morning and I look forward to going to work. I enjoy doing what we're doing now. I enjoy doing books. I mean, I've been publishing books and I still keep, you know, keep doing, you know, wherever I can get a good book published, if something that's certainly one of an idea that I'm high on, mm -hmm. I try to put my energy there. I like making films, developing projects. The whole process is much more fun than running a business of still photography. So that's why I did what I did for me. There are others that run it very successfully, uh, you know. Uh, uh, I'm quite friendly with Harry Benson. Mm -hmm. And Harry is lucky enough to have married uh, a, a woman who is a brilliant businessman. I had dinner with Harry and Gigi Benson uh, a week ago. And I remember saying to him, Geez, Gigi, if you'd been my agent, not only would I be a rich man today, but I would still, I would never sell my pictures. Well, sometimes the best business move is to make those decisions like you've made. I mean, it, it, you could be great at business, but if you're not happy... It's, it. it's nice to get up in the morning and enjoy going to work. I did not go enjoy going to work when my business was dealing with the photo lab on when is the print coming. The client says it's a birthday. they got to have it right away. The gallery framed the picture and... Uh, and stuck something tape on the back you know well that isn't what you're supposed to do with my prints you know what right i mean it's uh, just all this nonsense that uh, that happened uh, when i was running the business i didn't enjoy it maybe if i'd found someone to run the business for me yeah you know if i had a karen carpenter or a joe felice outside of time inc to run my business i'd still be in business right i don't mind signing prints i still sign uh, sure yes i sells my prints and i still sign them that's right. easy yeah yeah just but walk I don't in. worry about dealing with the lab and uh what's the new paper you're using it doesn't look as good as the old paper um, so you've got exhibits, you've been publishing books, you're, you're just, you, you've been really, in terms of business, you're, you're really spread yourself, you know, you, you're very diverse in how you're, you know, finding revenue sources, I, I imagine. Not, you know, yeah. Over the not, years. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's a, it trickles in, a little trickles in here, a little trickles in there, a little, you know. The main point is that I have the freedom now to do what I want to do. Right. And, uh, and I make a little less money. Uh, but I've never been motivated by money. I've been lucky enough to have a lot of fun career-wise, and I prefer that. Okay. Um, I, might, I don't know if anybody here has any questions. If you do, just raise your hand. Um, but I'm, I'm brown, winding down here. Um, before I go, uh, you know, what, uh, in your mind, what makes a good photo? Well, well, it depends on what you who you're shooting the photo for and what you're doing. If it's if you're on vacation with uh, with your wife or your kids or your grandkids or your girlfriend or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a picture that puts a smile on your face. Yeah, you know, and, right. and allows you to remember the fun time you had. You know, here's the day we spent. 
you know, in Rome or in Paris or whatever. Uh, if you're working and you're shooting for, for a, a magazine, it's, you know, every photographer likes to get the cover of the magazine or the lead double truck. Uh, it's to do something. I always thought that, you know, that when your peers are impressed, ah, that's, that's the, the most important thing. You know, nothing is as nice as getting to the game the following week and having someone say, what a great cover that was, you know. Yeah. So that mattered uh, if you're working on an ad. Now, for example, I mean, the other area where I made a business decision, most of my peers, there was a time when, and I certainly thought about it, and I've done a little bit of it, to make money. If you really want to make money in photography, the advertising community is where you work, the right. advertising business. John Zimmerman, who was one of my heroes, uh, at, he left Time Inc. at Sports Illustrated and Life Magazine eventually to do advertising to, and made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, Walt Eos has done a tremendous amount. I never liked that. I like the creativity of me being, because you asked me if uh, there was no boss along. When I went out to the game, I went myself. I chose how I was going to photograph something. And if I didn't, if I did a great job, I got more good assignments. If mm -hmm. you don't, if you consistently do lousy work, suddenly the assignments dry up. The advertising world is very lucrative, and uh, and it's, you know, it, and you can, and there's some pretty good pictures taken in advertising mm -hmm. but they're not your pictures there's an art director they have sold the client the concept mm -hmm. and basically what you're doing is they've got a tracing what they're really using is they want to have your name mm. you know it's real easy HBO does and she's, she's a brilliant photographer but uh, when the Sopranos were to, to be able to say yeah we've got Annie Leibovitz doing our ad right, campaign right 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 the ad agency, the client is very impressed. Mm -hmm, Andy Lieber mm -hmm. was wow, you sure, know. Yeah. But what Annie's doing there is basically doing. They've given her a sketch of what they want. It isn't like right. shooting the Vanity Fair, the fold-out cover right. that she does for Hollywood. It is here's the way they want to play it because Gandolfini's got to be here on that page, and you know right. they know that. Right. I never liked that. Yeah. So um, I do have one question from the internet. It's rather specific. Um, what is the coolest? Cover of Time, cover of Newsweek, cover of SI, or all three leading off spreads in SI? What is the coolest? <laughs> it would depend on the image. Oh, I mean, you know, I've seen some lousy covers on Newsweek. We never had a lousy cover on Time, of course. I've seen some lousy covers on Time in Sports Illustrated. I've seen some lousy leading off spreads. And then I've seen some that knock your socks off. You know, right. you just look at it. Uh, uh, there's a picture in the very newest issue of Sports Illustrated, which I got last night, uh, Robert Beck took. Of, I, and I watched the, uh, uh, the PGA Championship. There is this wonderful picture of Jason Day, I think, the, the winner of the tournament. His kid, his little boy was, oh, I don't know how old, uh, both feet off the ground, just about to jump into his father's arms. I've never seen one like it. You mm -hmm. know, it stopped me. That was the first leading off in the magazine this week. Well, that kind of stuff is always fun when you see it. Yeah. And sometimes, sometimes they're not that good. Yeah. Well, um, unless there's any other questions. No, anyone here? No, no, no. Okay. Um, I just want to say, Neil, thank you so much for taking the time to be on this uh, podcast. I, I, I don't, you mentioned your memoirs coming out. Uh, do you have any time frame when that's happening? Yes, yeah. It's uh, the University of Texas Press. Uh, wonderful publishers. I, I had no idea that this is a place they do 100 books a year. Oh, wow. And they've done some beautiful photo books. Uh, they did a fabulous book with Arnold Newman's work. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. in fact, mine is going to be basically the same, well, it is the same trim size. Uh, they did uh, the photographer who was the white, Eric Draper, is that the photographer? Was the White, white House, House photographer. Yep. Did a beautiful book of his eight years. With Bush. As with Bush. Yep. Uh, they've done some just some wonderful books. Uh, they're doing... Uh, publishing it it will be out next may okay it'll definitely be out before father's day i think they want to have it in bookstores at the beginning of may okay well we'll make sure to to post it on photo brigade um thank you thank you so much My pleasure. i really My appreciate pleasure. Thank this you. it's a pleasure and, and uh, everybody make sure to to subscribe to our youtube page uh, where you can see this uh, uh interview as well as all of our other awesome interviews thanks again to adorama canon professional services and of course to the amazing neil lifer well thank you so Alrighty. much it's a pleasure thanks thank everyone see you next time